I'm from SiteGround. I'm the CEO of SiteGround. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about the future of web hosting. So I, as I told you at lunch, I really like uh, talking about the future. It doesn't matter what lie I'm go going to be telling you. You either believe it or not, there is no way to prove me wrong. Or at least not right now. Uh, we'll have to wait for a couple of years to see if I'm wrong or not. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I chose this topic because uh, there is some exciting technology coming up. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about it. So I'm going to be starting. Uh, First of all, I, I just wanted to tell a few words about what, what web hosting is. Probably everybody here knows what web hosting is, right? Yeah, anyway, uh, web hosting is, is the, the way of putting your files of your website somewhere on a server uh, so that everybody else can see them. Uh, that's basically what it is. It, it's, it's done from uh, various services, such as web servers, SQL servers, backup servers, file servers. But all, all of those connected, they, they're web hosting. So there are several types, types of shared hosting. Probably all of you uh, have heard about shared hosting. Uh, shared hosting is uh, typically the, the biggest portion of web hosting that exists. Uh, it is used by the wider, uh, by a wide group of clients because it's predominantly cheap, and uh, it doesn't require a lot of knowledge to use uh, shared hosting. Another group of uh, hosting is called VPS. Has everybody heard of VPS? Right. Uh, so uh, VPS uh, is short term of virtual private server. So it's not a dedicated server, but it's not shared hosting. It's something in between. Uh, dedicated server, probably all of you know, it's, uh, it's a server that's dedicated to you. Uh, a lot more expensive and uh, a lot more powerful. And then there is the, the trendy one, cloud hosting. How many of you have used cl cloud hosting? Very few hands. Uh, probably all of you have used something that hosts in the cloud, like pictures on Facebook, or files in Dropbox, or similar services. There are all types of cloud hosting. Different service, but cloud hosting. So probably everybody uses that. Uh, so the big question is how, how all of those compare. So uh, in terms of pricing, there is probably uh, not many of you are going, going to be surprised that shared hosting is, is the cheapest of all and dedicated is, is the most expensive of all, VPS and cloud are in the middle. But uh, in terms of scaling, which, which is the trendy thing right now, if you get uh, 100,000 visitors tonight because you're featured in whatever, Gizmodo or TechCrunch, then uh, which one of those do you think would scale best? Cloud? cloud? Why VPS? Can't you do the same with the cloud? I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute. Yeah. Okay, so cloud scales the best, basically because cloud is a combination of a lot of computers, a lot of servers working as one, and VPS is just a single single server divided into multiple virtual private servers. So you can basically scale up to what your physical server is, and that's it. So here you can see dedicated scales kind of like shared. So you, in order to scale a dedicated server, first you can add more resources to it, like more RAM, but you need to shut it down. And that means downtime. And then you can add a second server, but you need to configure both servers to, to work as one. And that requires downtime as well. So dedicated doesn't really scale well. And um, there are a couple more things that you probably aren't told by your hosts really often. And uh, first of those things is that shared can scale. It can scale to handle a lot of traffic. And uh, this is typically done by caching. So how many of you use caching? Quite a lot. Yeah, last year when I asked this question, there were like only a few hands. OK, that's good. Uh, one thing that you should consider about caching is that 
when you use caching, that doesn't mean it, it will save you from a hardware failure. So uh, your site will be up probably when you get the traffic hit. But if that traffic hit for some reason hits the CPU and it goes down, then your site is down as well. So the true scaling always includes not only caching, but it in includes multiple nodes. So multiple web servers that would serve your website. And uh, with that regard, dedicated doesn't scale well. So it is difficult to make a dedicated server onto two servers. It is much easier to do that with a cloud box. Uh, believe it or not, as you said about the VPS, uh, VPS is still sh a shared hosting. So because you're sharing the same resources with other customers, basically. So there is still a way for other customers to overload the same server. And uh, uh, typically, it's, it's just shared. So as I said, VPS can scale in CPU and RAM, but up until what the host machine has. So if the host machine has 128 gigs of RAM, this is the most you can get out. Uh, but when the cloud hosting appeared, maybe three years ago, uh, many providers just renamed their, their offerings from VPS to cloud. So prob you've, you've probably seen that. Uh, uh, a true cloud can scale more than its physical host. So if the physical host has 128 gigs of RAM, a VPS is can scale only to the extent of how much is, is available from those 128. A true cloud can allow you to move one instance from here to there, so it can allow you to scale more. Not necessarily to more RAM or to more CPU, but it can move you to a freer server that, that has more resources available to your website only, and, and at the same time it can allow you to launch multiple instances on, on different servers so it can scale really, really well. Uh, VPS cannot do that. Like, how many of you have seen something like that in reality? Nobody? Yeah, that's what I expected. I haven't seen it either. Uh, so, I will try to tell you what I expect from the future, given what I told you so far. So, I think in the future, all hosting will become shared. And uh, even uh, if it sounds bad to you, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Because, as I said, VPS is shared. It's not a bad thing. Cloud, in its essence, is, it's shared too, because uh, uh, we're all basically sharing the cloud. So we're sharing the same storage. We're sharing the same servers. We don't feel it, but it's shared. So uh, sharing resources is not necessarily a bad thing. It's act I, if, if you ask me, it's actually a good thing, because uh, this means that we're using less servers to do more work, which means we're getting more efficient. More we're getting greener, we're spending less on energy. There are a lot of good things about it. And then with the cloud, there's the automated scaling. Automated scaling, uh, you can scale a lot of things. Uh, first of all, you can scale resources, such like CPU. So I've, I've given here an illustration uh, from uh, one of the brands we're working on. So here is a website that is very popular in off-peak hours. So it's, it's not re really using all the CPU. As you can see, it has two CPUs, two CPU, CPU cores, and the maximum it gets is it's around a, a core and a half. So what if it, it hits to, to the bottom or to the top? What happens then, do you know? The site goes down, basically. Or it slows down so much that it's it's considered to go down. Uh, what happens usually is th uh, that you start calling your hosting provider, start calling them names, they start doing some stuff, and at, at some point, the users, they, they don't want to see your downside anymore. The load goes down, and you don't need the resources anymore because nobody wants to see your site at this time. Well, uh, with, with the cloud, uh, resource spikes will be easy to handle it will be easy to give more CPU. It will be easy to uh, give more RAM. And here is, here is how we do it. There are other providers that do it differently, but basically we say, if my CPU reaches 90%, add one core. 
if my RAM reaches 70% at one gigabyte. So uh, basically, as soon as you need another CPU, it's added to you. As soon as you don't need it anymore, it's removed. So it's hot scale, and uh, you just activate it by one click. And that's it. You forget about it. So uh, what if you need something more complex then? Because uh, just adding CPU and RAM typically doesn't solve the problem. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's a problem caused by the software, which is usually the case, uh, then just adding, throwing more CPU at it would help, but it won't solve the problem. It won't make the PHP run faster or anything else. And if you add more RAM, but you don't say to, to, to the MySQL in its config file, use more RAM, it won't automatically start using more RAM. So in order to, to, to be truly scalable, you need to do something like this, which to me, it looks a little bit complicated. But this is high, how a uh, high availability setup looks like. This is, this is actually something that we've done for a client that, that is very extremely complicated Joomla setup. This is super highly available. It, it allows different servers to be promoted as web servers and MySQL servers. And it cost us like a month to do it. So what if you can do that with one click? Right now, it's not really possible. But uh, I think it will be in the future because um, typical redundant setup includes all of those stuff. Like it in includes multiple load balanced application servers and replicated databases and multiple geograph geographic locations. And uh, they all should be acting as one. And that is extremely difficult to accomplish. But I, I really think that in the future, you will be able to do it with one click. I create a setup that, that's going to do it. I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. Right now, in order to do it, you have to be like this guy. Like you need to be the, the geek guy, the guy that understands Linux, the guy that understands MySQL replication, the guy that knows what uh, MySQL proxy is. How many of you know what MySQL proxy is? Just Brian and Philip? OK, three guys. That's good. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what about Heartbeat? Have, you, have anybody heard of Heartbeat? OK, two people. So Heartbeat, for example, is, a, is an open source software that allows two servers to promote and demote each other from being a master or a slave. So in case one of the server goes down, the other serve can, server can self-promote him as a master and start acting as the first server. And this is extremely difficult to configure. And if it messes up, so if it, if it uh, for example, if the slave server promotes as a master while the master is active, then a lot of bad things can happen to your database, for example. And uh, another, another service that is used for complicated setups like this is GlusterFS, which is a, a, a network file system that allows you to use the same storage on different servers. So all of those can be configured automatically. So I've, I've shown how we do it. Uh, basically, it's one click add load balancer. There are other providers doing it uh, in a different way. But what, what we've done so far is we've taken that setup. We've spent a lot of time optimizing it and allowed a single server to be cloned into like five different servers or into seven different servers. And it can all go with, with one click as soon as you get the traffic hit. And as soon as you don't need it anymore, you can just destroy six of those seven instances. You said go with the slave. Can it be automated instead? It could, but I can, can think of a number of reasons not to do so. Uh, but probably discuss it after. So. Uh, I think in, in the short future, it would be possible uh, not only to create like load balancing nodes, but also to use other servers to use compute tasks for you. This is actually possible at the moment on the Google App Engine. So they, they can, for example, if you're doing a mobile app or some kind of app, you can just say, hey, I want this process to run on different servers as soon as I need them. And it will happen automatically without you knowing about it. They will charge you per query, and it, it's extremely, extremely complicated pricing. But uh, 
it is possible. So if Google does it, then probably the rest of us will start doing it very soon, as soon as we figure out how. And then um, yeah, you, you could probably ask if, if all of that that I said so far is going to be extremely expensive. And the short answer is no, because uh, billing by the minutes I is already a very popular thing among, among cloud providers. So you will pay only for the resources that you're going to use. So if you scale to seven machines for four hours, you will, you will pay seven machines for four hours. Then you will scale back and you will pay just one machine. And uh, in my opinion, from the calculations that I've done, it's actually going to be cheaper. Because at the time you have no usage on your website, you can use like one CPU core and one gig of RAM. And then at the time you need it, you can scale to two CPU cores and four gigs of RAM. But the time you need it is usually much, much shorter than the time you don't need it. Because you don't need, don't need a lot of resources on f Saturdays and Sundays. You don't need a lot of resources on national holidays. You don't need a lot of resources during the night. So all of this will make it cheaper. Because right now you can get a, I don't know, a VPS that's, that costs 100 euro a month and has two CPU cores and two gigs of RAM. And that might be enough for like 90% of the time, but you will still pay 100 euro the whole time. And then when it's not enough, you won't, wouldn't be able to scale it. So it's not really good. So uh, you might wonder why all of the stuff that I, I talked to you about uh, wasn't uh, able to happen before now. Uh, there are a few reasons for that. And uh, the biggest of all was it was really, really difficult to add new servers. Uh, like it was not only getting the hardware, but you needed, you needed to, to put up that hardware, put it in a rack, connect it to, in, to the internet, and then start the whole setup procedure. Like, put MySQL, put Nginx, put whatever you want to put inside. And that is slow. Even, even using uh, like automated systems like Puppet or other systems, it is still a slow, painful process. And uh, there is an elegant solution to that, and it's called containers. How many of you have heard of Linux containers? Just Brian? Brian has heard of everything <laughs> today. So. Uh, Basically, I think the, the containers are the neg next big thing in, in the hosting industry. And uh, they are uh, what containers are. Uh, they're basically a VPS, but with no overhead to the host node. What I mean is a VPS takes resources for the VPS itself, and then it takes some of the resources for the virtualization layer. A container is no more than a process within the Linux system. So it doesn't take the overhead. So you, you save something like 15% of the system resources that you usually throw at the virtualization layer for, for being used. So this is really a, a good thing. And uh, Google, for example, as a big provider, they're 100% Linux containers now. So they're all of the boxes that they have, they have split into containers, and they're using it. And in a recent statement from last week, they said that they're adding 2 billion containers a week. You got it right, 2 billion. Like that's 3,300 a second, or like 200,000 since I started talking about containers. And that's a lot. And uh, I understand them because container, a container is really, really better than a VPS in basically every single way that it is. It is more efficient. It, uh, it can use the same resources while uh, using less resources. Uh, it can scale up, it can scale down, it can scale up uh, rebootlessly. You can move a container from here to there without downtime. Uh, you can play with it and do uh, various stuff with containers and it's still good. It is still on the way of development, like uh, the Linux containers, uh, it's called LHIC-C. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about it. It's not very advanced yet, but uh, there are a lot of people that, that work on containers right now, and I think it's going to be the, the next big thing. Uh, especially when Google is using it, it's making it more trendy, and now people want to come 
and uh, show that they're using containers. Um, so the, the second problem, I, I told you that uh, there were a couple of problems. The second big problem, uh, aside from containers, was the storage. So uh, for a long time, for a long time, the storage uh, has been the, the bottleneck of, of modern computing. So uh, a hard drive, a spinning hard drive, is basically the slowest part that you have in your computers. And you know that your computer is as fast as the slowest part in it. So now we have the SSD drives, which makes it faster, uh, makes it much faster than before. But we're still not there yet. I mean, uh, we, ha we have had write 10s and caching and a lot of stuff for a long time, but still storage is the bottleneck. Because uh, basically it's slow and it breaks. And both of those create a lot of issues. So we, we, have, had, we have had the NAS, SANS, and DAS storages for a long time. And uh, as you probably know, that all of those storages, they're, they're super expensive. Uh, they're not really very reliable. And, uh, and like uh, Sith Masters in, in Star Wars movies, they always come in pairs because uh, you need to have a backup. So you, uh, you basically, uh, to, to have a storage right now, you need to spend something like, depending on how much terabytes you, you need, you need to spend something like $100,000 to $300,000, which is not really amount of money that everybody's willing to spend. So those guys, the Googles, the Amazons, and the Ebays, they, they have had distributed storage for a long time. Does anybody know what a distributed storage is? Nope. So distributed storage is, let's take my laptop and say that I have 20 more laptops like that. Distributed storage is the storage that gets all the hard drives of those laptops and combines them without the, the, lap, the hard drives need, uh, needing to be in the same computer physically. So it combines them over the network. So say we have a 10 gig network and we have a, lo a lot of computers connected to each other and simple hard drives in those computers, no rate cards, no expensive hardware and just network. And uh, distributed storage is, is the software piece that runs on every single computer that says this piece of data goes here, here and here. And when I, when I read it, I will read it from 10 places and it's gonna be extremely fast. And when uh, five nodes go down, I wouldn't care because I have the data here and here and here. So those guys, they, they have had the storage for a long time. And uh, I think the statement is true. Uh, the Googles and the Amazons, they, they have had a cloud for a long time, much longer that, than we have had the cloud. And this is primarily because they had the storage. They were able to have the same information in every single data, data center that they have servers and it was super fast to be accessed and it was redundant. So if, if, if a server goes away or if a hundred servers goes away, uh, the, the information would still be there. Have you, have you heard of Google losing data? No, right? So distributed storage is the biggest part of the cloud nowadays. And you cannot build a cloud without storage. So you can use expensive storage or you can use distributed storage. Expensive storage is basically inefficient and distributed storage was, was not there up until two years ago. So um, nowadays, uh, extremely fast distributed storage systems exist. Uh, there are some, for example, we as a company invested in one uh, called Storpool. Uh, it, is, uh, it is our vision that distributed storage would help, would help us go in the cloud and become uh, better with, at what we do. But uh, there are open source and free ones too that are very decent. For example, Ceph uh, is an open source and freely available distributed storage system that any of you can download and use on the servers that you have. And uh, there is also the BGFS. It is, it, it is formerly known as FHGFS, uh, which is known to be really high performance. It is, by the way, uh, made in Germany like German cars, I don't know. And, uh, and then there is the GlusterFS. This one, probably some of you have heard. It has been acquired by Red Hat, 
and it's been a uh, around for a while. Uh, it's been very reliable. For example, we are using GlusterFS for our web our own website, SiteGround.com runs on, on multiple servers, and we're sharing infrastructure below it with GlusterFS. So it is a very reliable and mature network file system that allows you to, for example, you have a Joomla, and you want to have like Joomla on five different servers, but you don't want to upload your files to fi five different servers. So you can share the Joomla folder with GlusterFS on five, 10, whatever amount of servers you want to, and just upload to one to them, and the rest will follow automatically. So basically, um, having that technology allows us to allows us to have like every startup to be the next big data company, because up until now it was tremendously expensive to be that big data company. You needed a lot of hardware. You needed to write custom software for it. That software usually didn't. In Bulgaria, where I'm from, I, I sit on the board of two startups that, uh, that do big data stuff. Uh, one of them is called Transmetrics, and they are trying to solve the problem of companies like DHL and FedEx. So they're trying to, to make, for example, one truck leaving Germany for, for Belgium half empty, and they're trying to predict when that's going to happen so that the truck doesn't leave half half empty and in order to do that they're using some insanely complex algorithms and they're saving saving it at an insane rate to the hard drives and they're trying to do that multiple times a day for different companies and f two years just two years ago what what they do wouldn't have been possible it it they would have needed so much money just to prove that their theory works that in reality no, they would, wouldn't have been able to start their company at all. Uh, the other company I talked to, it's called Stades. It is kind of the same thing, uh, but they're, they're, they're working with scientists. Uh, what they do is uh, they're getting uh, things that scientists want to calculate and they, they put it in, into their cloud and they give them as much resources as as, as the scientists need just to calculate their stuff. And uh, as soon as the calculation is done, they output the result. So uh, they, they told me that there's they, they're resolving a big problem for, for the scientists because right now those scientists either have to wait for a, for a big data computer that is available in their university, but probably available next month or next year, or alternatively run the tests on their own computers, which as you probably know, is particularly slow. So uh, what they did was uh, they, they just throw out resources at the scientist for two hours, for three hours, and they charge them for the hour. And uh, that same thing wouldn't have been possible two years ago. And uh, it is a use case that every startup now can do the next Google or can do the next Facebook, because the technology exists. And it's, it's not super expensive to start this thing now. It is not super expensive to prove your theory. And it can be done. In the future, it will be much, much easier than that. So all of this uh, makes the future of hosting very exciting. At least to me, it makes it very exciting. Um, there are a lot of new, new things com coming down the way. But the biggest problem I see right now is uh, the software that we have right now is, is, is not made to scale. So uh, most of the software that I've seen running on the web isn't really highly scalable. You can scale it uh, if you're the Linux guru guy that knows how to do that, that knows how to configure servers and cheat the software that it's running on one place and, it, and at the same time it's not. Uh, but most of the time, this is not the case. Uh, so for example, there is no, as I show you, that complex graphic with Joomla, there is no easy way to, to make a, a Joomla run on, on five servers. There is, right now there isn't. If, even if there is like the one, one click load balancing thing, there would still be things that will break because the software isn't meant to, to run on different ser servers. And I think this is a key thing for the future is, is, is like, the software, like hardware, wasn't engineered to scale, but that will change. 
at some point that that will have to change so uh, the technology evolves and the software will probably evolve it with it some point later basically that's it thank you guys <laughs>